Well, welcome everyone. Hello. Um, we're going to be beginning the Assembly Bill 617 consultation group meeting. So my name is Adriana and I work in the Office of Community Air Protection, also referred to as OCAP. And I'm going to give a quick review of some Zoom controls before uh, we continue on with today's meeting. So the options may differ depending on if you're a panelist or an attendee. Panelist view is for the consultation group members and staff, and attendees view is for everyone in the public that is not a panelist. So here we have a few visuals to help describe how everyone can participate today. The reactions feature is enabled, and <clears throat> during the participation or discussion period to raise your hand, you may have to click reactions and then click raise hand to be placed in the queue to speak. And for those of us joining us on the phone today, to raise your hand, please dial the number sign or pound sign with the number two. And to unmute, dial star six. We encourage consultation group members to use their video so that attendees can see you. And to do so, you just simply click on the video icon. The chat feature today uh, will be used by staff or panelists only to share links and information to the public. Now, we have public comment periods throughout the meeting, but if panelists and attendees have any questions, we have the Q&A function available for you to submit your questions at any time. And staff will be monitoring the Q&A to address your question during public comment. So please put your question into the Q&A, <laughs> excuse me, and make sure your name is displayed correctly on Zoom. For consultation group members, this means name and affiliation, please. And of course, if you have any technical challenges, please reach out to Brian. And now if I could please pass your attention along to Ms. Liliana Nuez for consultation group member roll call. Thanks so much, Adri. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, Dr. Bombs, the chairs, and, and Davina Hurt are here. Awesome. Jana, I think um, I got an email saying she was not going to be able to make it. Please let me know if you're here. Okay. Um, Gustavo might be on the phone and would not show up here. But I, I know there are a few people on the phone, so... Um, I think one of them is him. Um, Paula Torado, we are. Okay, Miss um, Margaret Gordon. It's here. Hey, Miss Margaret. Uh, Kevin Hamilton. Jesse Marquez. I think I see him. Yeah, he's here. Um, Luis Olmedo. I'm not. Will Barrett. Um, Dave Edwards. Present. Hi, Dave. Hi. Um, Paul English, let me know he wasn't going to be here. Um, Erica Manuel. Veronica Eady. I think I saw. I'm here. Hi, I'm Veronica. Hi. And uh, Catherine Higgins in here. place of. Hi, Catherine. And I know that um, Susan Nakamura is here as uh, an alternate, also in attendees. Um, Samir, or right? Oh, we have Jess here. Yes. Hi, Jess. Hi. Jess Olson. Um, Tong, I think I saw him here. Hi, I'm here. Hi, Tom. Um, Roger Isom. Um, Kathy Reese Boyd or um, Christine Zimmerman. Good afternoon. Uh, Christine's here. Hi, Christine. And then Christine Wolf. Here. Hey, Christine. Um, Dr. Michael Jarrett. He told me uh, by email that it's it's uh, the wrong time for him in Spain. Still, lovely that he's still there. Um, okay, great. Um, Michael Klein, Dr. Michael Kleiman is. I'm here. 
Here, thank you. And Dr. Jenny Quintana? Here, just Jenny is fine. Thank you, Jenny. Um, okay, great. Um, pretty sure we have quorum, right? And um, we only have a few um, people missing. So um, I think Michelle will drop um, the list of names in the chat in a bit. Next slide, please. So um, Dr. Bombs can welcome us. Yep, brings welcome there are no slides. You're muted, Dr. Bombs. Not now, thank you. So uh, really appreciate everybody's time and effort again. And so welcome uh, everybody on the consultation group and all the public members of the audience as well. Uh, so just an overview of our last meeting, which I thought was a productive one, we actually concluded the review of the people's blueprint, uh, which I can speak for the agency as well as the OCAP staff that it was the people's blueprint and the review by the consultation group are very uh, helpful and important to the staff's development of uh, blueprint 2.0. Um, just to remind everybody, uh, the staff has to write the Blueprint 2.0, and it's an important component of our statewide strategy for how to implement the Community Air Protection Program, uh, AB 617. But, uh, and the People's Blueprint is an important, a very important, an extremely important uh, input into what the staff is writing to the Blueprint 2.0, but it's not going to be verbatim. We've talked about that in the past, but just to make it clear. Uh, I and, and the consultation group is going to have input on what the staff writes in terms of Blueprint, Blueprint 2.0. Uh, in fact, today we're going to start that discussion. Uh, there's an expanded concepts outline for the Blueprint 2.0. Um, that we're going to need your comments about. Uh, that document was released recently released, and I hope that you know at least some of you have had a chance to look at it. But we'll we'll be going over that outline today, and uh, that outline is of expanded concepts for Blueprint 2.0. Uh, you know, prior prioritizes environmental justice, equity, and civil rights, uh, which the original blueprint. Uh, did not. And that was, you know, again, between the People's Blueprint and the consultation group discussion of People's Blueprint, we've got it. Uh, and we're trying to make sure that the that Blueprint 2.0 uh, is not only informed by the those uh, priorities, but actually uh, advances them. And, you know, we've, we're going to have participatory budgeting and budget transparency and tracking progress, uh, just some of the recommendations from the People's Blueprint. And um, I'm happy to uh, turn over the welcome to my uh, co-chair, uh, Supervisor Davina Hurt. Thank you, Dr. Balms. And I'll just echo um, a hearty welcome to everybody here on the consultation group meeting. Um, let's go to slide five. Uh, you've all done this many times before. I do wanna emphasize that we're very interested in hearing from all of you, um, the diverse views uh, in this meeting. And I want people to feel free to express their thoughts, even if they have differing points of view from the prior speaker, you're all in the space because of your unique point of view and beliefs. And so sharing the space together um, would be, uh, will bring the most robust conversation forward. Uh, folks, uh, please rely on meeting agreements previously used. They're listed before you. I don't think I need to read them. And I guess next slide. We had uh, Don, actually, Dr. Bombs, it's over to you now. Or I can take it. <laughs> you can take it if you want. I was having trouble okay. finding the unmute button. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll take it on. So uh, we had an agenda setting meeting on November the 2nd, 2022. 
most consultation group members in attendance agreed on uh, the meeting objectives uh, and agenda before you. Today's meeting objectives are to learn more about and discuss the Blueprint 2.0 development process and opportunities for engagement, uh, such as upcoming workshops and meetings, as well as recommendations for the new AB 617 selected communities. If you see here before our agenda, we will definitely hear about the fifth annual community recommendation and selection process, um, followed by public comments on that item. Then we'll have the update and discussion on the Blueprint 2.0 process. And we'll just, we'll talk about the draft engagement plan and um, a new document uh, that Dr. Baums talked a little bit about as far as the, the pieces uh, that are in them, which is um, to expand on the concepts outlined for the blue, uh, Blueprint 2.0 um, around equity. Uh, um, after that, we'll have a public comment section and then we'll um, look at program updates and we'll hear an update on the ad, ad hoc government at work. Um, this is a temporary group of a few consultation group members that are working on developing a charter for the consultation group. So uh, stay tuned um, to the end as, as we'll be letting you know about a workshop for kicking off new funding opportunities in the community air grants. And again, we'll have a um, public comment uh, section open uh, to the general public. And we'll wrap up with next steps and um, our upcoming meeting. So now um, I will I hand take, it over to yeah. Dr. Balms to frame uh, our presentation. So the first you know, agenda item is the community recommendation and selection process. And, and we did have a uh, public workshop on this that some of you, you know, may have attended, I did. Uh, and uh, so staff will, you know, bring their recommendations for community to develop a SERP or camp. You know, they do that annually to the board. Um, and we're now in the fifth year. So these are the, the year five recommendations and um, they're expected next February, 2023 to be uh, heard by the board. Um, as I think most of you know, there are currently 17 communities in the program uh, and we're going to add uh, a couple more. Many of the discussions here at the consultation group are centered around the lessons learned uh, in developing and implementing uh, camps and SERPs. Uh, and so as we consider new communities uh, for AB 617, whether they are camps, SERPs, or both, uh, staff is, is working towards a reimagined program in which we serve more overburdened communities in the state. We've talked about that before. You know, we, we don't have the resources for every community to be fully designated as an AB 617 community, but we'd like to help all the communities that are disproportionately burdened with air pollution uh, around the state. So just keep that in mind. The staff has to both uh, come up with recommendations for new formally designated AB 617 communities, but also to try to uh, reimagine a program which will serve more uh, overburdened communities. And so Laura, I think you're up uh, to give us more information about the recommended communities uh, for year five of AB 617 implementation. Thank you, Dr. Bombs. So the first slide that we're gonna show is um, the annual community consideration process. Um, this process has been fairly consistent over the last, um, well, pretty much since the program started. Um, so we continually take self-nominations for communities. Um, and we usually ask for air district recommendations by the end of October. And then this is all for preparation to going to the board in, at, in February. Um, we follow the process outlined in the blueprint in, in Appendix B, we outline the community identification and selection process. And by statute, the CARB board must consider selection of new communities annually for either a community mission reduction program or a, a community air monitoring program or both. Um, so the self-nominations that we receive, we um, usually 
provide those to the air districts so they can consider that in their um, recommendations as well. And we post the list of the self nominations on our program website and the list um, gets updated as communities nominations are received. So currently there's about 120 communities on the list. Um, and as new self nominated communities are presented, we will add them. But the list has remained fairly consistent since um, most of the communities that are come in as nominations are already on the list. So as in prior years, we encourage community recommendations from um, community members to, to work with their local air districts. Um, and as in, in um, prior years, as I mentioned, we request that the districts provide their nominations by the end of October so we can prepare our staff report that will go to the board, um, that will pl plan to go to the board in February. Next slide, please. So as in prior years, there's resource limitations, both with funding and capacity. So only those nominations that are supported by the air districts are being recommended. So there are two new year five communities in consideration. The first is the Bayview Hunters Point, Southeast San Francisco community, which is located in the Bay Area. This community is being recommended for SERP only. Um, the Bay Area AQMD is supporting the self-nomination. The community is also supported by two community groups, the Bayview Hunters Point Community Advocates and the Marie Harrison Community Foundation. Um, taken from the community meeting that the Air District held in October, the preliminary air pollution concerns associated with this community include elevated PM 2.5 emissions, truck traffic from the impacts from nearby freeways, industrial facilities, and potential impacts from the Hunters Point Naval Shipyard, which is a federally designated Superfund site. The second community is the North End Phase One community and includes the cities of Westmoreland, Brawley, and Calipatria, located in Imperial County. This community is being recommended for both a SERP and a CAMP. This recommendation was submitted by Imperial County Air Pollution Control District in partnership with CCV. The North End Phase One community share similar regional concerns with the Calexico Heber El Centro Corridor community, which includes air pollution concerns from agricultural related activities like agricultural equipment and pesticides applications, impacts from heavy duty vehicles, fugitive emissions, and um, fugitive emissions from unpaid roads and also from the Salton Sea. Next slide. So we plan to release the staff report with the community recommendations by mid-January, and then we'll present our recommendations to the board on February 22nd. Our board item is scheduled for 4 p.m., but we ask people to double check um, the CARB websites 10 days prior to the board meeting for the latest information. And now I'd like to open it up for any comments or questions. My hand is raised, Ms. Margaret Gordon. Go ahead, Ms. Margaret. Okay, let's go back to um, let's go back to slide one. Go back to slide one. One moment while we pull up the slides, Ms. Margaret. The first one in the community recommendation yes. presentation? Yeah. OK. okay. This slide should be re reframed as where, how CARB and the, Bay, and the Air District is going to orientate and educate the new uh, uh, people who apply. Should not, there should not be any more communities nominated without that prerequisites. Because what, what is happening is that based on the fact that some, some, some of these communities with self nom don't have the capacity, they don't have the background in environmental justice, they may know about the environmental justice, they have not been grounded and uh, grounded in um, community engagement, they have not been grounded in um, how to proceed uh, with such a process. There needs to be a 
change to bringing people to these tables or establishing establishing how you get to this table. It has to be that there is a greater need for free work to support the capacity of these groups. Some people some you're gonna have some groups don't even have have not had a baseline education on, on air monitoring. And they're gonna spend a lot of time and money, whatever money they get, trying to find somebody to help them with the air monitoring. And I think that and and base and also those of us who've been in this AB 617 two, three or four more years should be also having fellowship and mentorship with, with some of these with the with the people who are coming in. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank Margaret. Thank you, Ms. Margaret, because I think you make some very good points. Um that I think staff has considered uh but I can't underscore as, uh, enough that uh, the more training and mentorship, as you mentioned, I think that's a great idea for uh, uh, the more training and mentorship that community groups that are interested in, in applying for AB 617 designation, uh, the more training and, and mentorship, the better. So thank you for that. And I agree. I, um, we talked about this actually a week ago uh, in a small group about how do we share best practices um, and um, talk to one another uh, throughout the state so we can learn from one another. Uh, I see uh, Veronica Edie's hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, I do want to support Miss Margaret's comments, although that was not why I raised my hand, but um, an example, uh, well, I wanted to just lift up the community air grants. Um, one of the communities that we're working on right now that CARB designated in 2022 is East Oakland. And we've had ongoing conversations with one of our board members who happens to be the mayor of San Leandro, which is the bordering community. And she's been a big advocate for her community, and rightfully so. There are certainly a number of sources that are right along the border. And so she's been advocating for um, San Leandro to be part of within the boundaries. One of the issues in San Leandro is that the community organizing there is not as um it's it's not as present as it is in in Oakland. And so um, through the community air grants, actually, um, there's a group in um, San Leandro that I have seen over the last couple of years really uh, build its capacity. Um, you know, there's a lot more of that that needs to happen in the Bay Area. And that mentoring that Miss Margaret talks about is really important. Um, and but um, if there was some way to just, I don't know, kind of formalize that or get the, the message out there about community air grants and for that purpose more, I think that that would be really helpful for building capacity. But um, I really just raised my hand because I wanted to thank CARB for, for the workshop. Um, that was Tuesday. I'm trying to remember because I have community meetings. Every it, was a it was a Tuesday. <laughs> I have meetings every night this week, so I've kind of lost lost what day it was. But um, it was a really good meeting, and so I want to uh, just commend CARB for that. We are very excited in the Bay Area to be able to put forward Baby Hunters Point in San Francisco. Um, just this morning, the San Francisco Examiner did an article on a meat rendering plant in um, Baby Hunter's Point and um, Santa Clara Law School also today published a report on the odors from that particular plant. So it speaks to um, the, the real need in Baby Hunter's Point. So we're looking forward to that. And um, I also wanna just um, lift up our community partners, um, Baby Hunter's Point Community Advocates and the Marie Harrison Community Foundation. Um, they did submit um, a self-nomination. Um, we're very fortunate that we had that kind of capacity in Baby Hunter's Point. 
um, the air district supported that self nomination, and so we're um, excited about um, going before the CARB board. We will be at, at that meeting and um, looking forward to getting the work started. So thanks, uh, OCAP team. And I, I have a suspicion that um, Ms. Margaret already knows some of the folks uh, Bayview Hunter's point, but I think- uh, Yes, I do. Maybe, maybe formalizing some mentorship would be, be good because uh, I can't think of anybody better for the Bayview Hunter's Point uh, CSC to be developed uh, to have Ms. Margaret as uh, a mentor. So I see Ms. Margaret's hand raised and then Erica. I'm put it down. Oh, okay. Then Erica. Hi, good afternoon, Erica Manuel with the Institute for Local Government. Just to echo some of the comments that I've heard so far, my question is actually one of, well, comment first, congrats on identifying some new communities, that's always exciting. Um, my question is more about process and whether or not maybe this is a question for the Bay Area um, Air Quality Management District and others about what kind of response you've gotten from the local governments that are adjacent to the air districts, so, you know, the cities and the counties. In the San Francisco, obviously, community, it's the combo city county, but what are some of the um, public local agency kind of responses to this? And was there in, was there coordination with those applications or is there awareness of it? And, and certainly they play a role in the implementation process. So just curious how that how that's going, how they are feeling about it and what the plan is for the local agency coordination around those um, efforts. Can I? Yes, please jump I, in. Okay, great. And then we'll go to Jenny. Uh, great question, um, Erica. Yeah, you know, um, the, well, there are a couple of things at play here. First, first, um, you know, I have to acknowledge that our board, our, our, our board members are elected officials. So we've had a lot of um, interest and a lot of support for our board members. So in Richmond, San Pablo, um, John Joya is on the board of supervisors of Contra Costa County, and he has been very involved and really helpful in connecting us with the right people, especially with um, the Department of, of, of Health in um, Contra Costa County. Um, and the same goes for our, our other um, counties that we're working in. So, you know, I had a, a conversation just yesterday um, with Nate Miley, who's on our board, and he's on the board of supervisors and um, represents uh, for Alameda County. And so he's very interested. Um, we're giving our board members, you know, regular updates on what's going on. Sometimes they turn up, but as I said, it's been really helpful in making those um, connections to the right people, whether it's in the health department or in um, city planning, which in San Francisco, I'm assuming that city planning is probably gonna wanna be involved as well as some other um, agencies. So we've gotten um, a lot of support and um, a lot of enthusiasm from uh, local government. And I think that that's really, and I'm going to be quiet in just a minute, and I think that that's really critical since AB 617 doesn't have, you know, the legal um, uh, hook to bring in um, local government like that. Um, it's really important for them to, to come to the table and be a part of it and buy in. We couldn't be successful without them. And so your point is is really um, very important and they play a really key role. So I know Luis had his hand up first, but maybe Jenny, were you gonna add to prior comments? Oh, no, Luis was first. Um, okay. Really different take, thank you. Welcome, Luis. Yeah, hi, thank you. I'm sorry I'm off camera, uh, but uh, I just want to join in the in the good spirit of uplifting the baby hunters point uh, and um, you know also uh, Miss Margaret's uh, comments you know it's been uh, an ask that has been there from the very beginning in making sure that there was technical assistance and I think it would be great if the if CARB set aside resources to make sure that these communities who need more 
equitable support, have those resources to hire uh, the expertise that they need to bring them to a sort of a level table uh, rather than just, um, you know, a lopsided one where the governmental agency kind of dictates and has all the resources to make decisions and and put things on the table. We want to make sure that the community itself also has that kind of a support. And, and going back to the Bayview Hunters, I, I wanted to uplift the California Environmental Justice Coalition. I feel like it's been around for a while and it's, it's uh, the largest, more diverse, most diverse environmental justice coalition. I'm proud founding member and state has just continues to overlook that coalition, but you know, a lot of the members are from baby hunters point as well. So just want to do a little shout out for them and making sure CARB engages them, not just get caught up with, you know, those of us who do a lot of work around advocacy and policy, you know, CEJC stays true to the EJ principles as we all do, but don't overlook CEJC and thank you. Great, uh, Jenny. Hi, actually my comment was fairly similar to Luis where um, I think the idea of, of mentorship and as Luis brought up technical assistance is very important, um, but I think the communities shouldn't be asked to provide the mentorship on top of everything else they're doing. Like I think there should be a formal program perhaps you sign up to be a mentor and get some support um, or maybe have support for a staff member to help with that mentorship, have a, like a, maybe an intermediate program, like you're thinking of applying. Um, so we're gonna give you, and I had proposed this before, I believe, but a really cheap thing to do is to get community college students um, or any kind of students, state college, I work at a state college, but to have student interns that get they get the experience of environmental justice, plus they help people with preparation and having like a, a carb core that went out and to help um, to help just be there and make schedule meetings and and kind of make things happen, um, I think would be a good idea to, to help sis as well as uh, perhaps more specific technical assistance from carb, but also to have other community groups. Be recognized and supported for mentorship rather than you know being asked to kind of do that on top of everything else. Thank you. Thank you everyone for all your comments. I think we've now come to public comments um, on this item. I think we'll move forward with no more than two minutes per I'm speaker. Here, uh, Davida. Oh yes. Okay, Davida. I yes. think before we go to the next item, can we hear some recommendations about next steps where would this land this whole thing about mentorship land we need to close this out to have some probable possible uh, place for this to go i would like to hear where are we trying what what is the possibilities to put this somewhere before okay we go Ms. Margaret, I, yeah i appreciate that question and let me see if there's anybody and OCAP or the CARP staff that like to respond. Delvi. Hey everyone, nice to see um, everyone today. Um, absolutely right. Uh, Jenny, I'm just gonna peel off of your last comment here. I, I um, certainly don't want any of us at CARB to assume or expect that our community uh, representatives today that are on this group and others that we work with would just take it upon themselves to mentor others um, without compensation. Um, certainly that's uh, important for all of us. So anytime there's uh, funds involved because of that recognition, we do have to do some internal deliberation and make sure that we have the resources to be able to cover it. Um, for example, I think uh, Veronica, your comment about the community air grants, um, uh, very well received and, and thank you for the, the shout out as well. Um, that could be one avenue that we'd look to um, to you know, look at that request for applications and consider uh, the possibility of a new type of project that would um, support organizations that have actually been through the 617 process, uh, being able to compete for a project where they could essentially serve as mentors in a more statewide capacity. That's an idea. It's not something I can promise we can do right here on the spot. 
Um, but I can tell you, we've got all kinds of, uh, of conversations going behind the scenes about how we might make something like this real. So Ms. Margaret, I would ask your indulgence to let us go through that process and come back and report to this group. And also on whose agenda or work plan will this be? For clarification. It would be an o OCAP's lap, OCAP's responsibility. Okay, so it sounds like we'll put a pin in this and folks will go back and OCAP talk about what's possible and look at how it could be funded and return back to us in the, in the near future on the possibilities. Okay, um, let's move to public comments. Do we have any hands raised, Liliana? On this item? No, no hands raised, but Adri, could you remind me, is it star? Six to raise your hand if you're on the phone. We have quite a few it's people on the phone. Pound two or the number two. signed two to raise your hand. Hashtag two for the new generation. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So if there's anybody <laughs> on the phone that would like to make an additional comment, your time is now. Star two or no, sorry, pound two, hashtag two. <laughs> and then star six to mute and unmute. Thank you. No, nobody's coming up right now. Okay, excellent. Um, so we'll move on, I guess, to the update on the Blueprint 2.0 process engagement plan. Actually, and actually, before we move there, I see Chanel Fletcher's hands raised. There we go. Hi, all. Um, I wanted to pop on because I think I just wanted to add and build on to what Delvi was saying. And so um, I actually think this is like a super, super helpful conversation. And I think, Miss Margaret, that's exactly right, that this would be, it would be an OCAP's lap. So I think um, I appreciate the indulgence on our end to think through process. I did want to flag that I know um, in our, our last solicitation, we did have a section for community capacity building. And that was really a project where we were looking for communities um, across California to build grassroots capacities um, and provide tools to maximize participation in AB 617. And so um, we were really looking for applicants that had the ability to work with state and local agencies that have already been through the AB 617 kind of community process and already had developed um, a SERP. And so uh, CCAC was actually awarded for this last year so i think we actually have in some ways and i'm not saying that this is the you know the end all be all to what we're discussing around mentoring but i think we have the starting of some of what this is and so i think based on this conversation it would make a lot of sense for us to kind of uh think through what we already have what we would additionally want to see based on this conversation and talk that through a little bit more and then i think we could come back but i, I did want to flag that and note that we, um, we did have this a little bit in our last solicitation already and that CCAC had already been awarded funds for this. So there's one at least example of this and I think we could further flesh it out and think through it. And because I do work with CCAC in the San Joaquin Valley, I think it's been actually very helpful to uh, other groups, uh, including the, I don't know what year round it was that we, uh, I don't know if it was year four or year three uh, designation of like our friend Lamont, for example. I, I do think that CCAC, that that grant they got the, has been very helpful for expanding uh, AB 617 related activities in um, the San Joaquin Valley. So thank you for Chanel for, for reminding us of that. So should we go on to the next agenda item? Yes, please. Okay, um, so uh, the next item is the update on the Blueprint, Blueprint 2.0 process. Uh, and so, uh, as we've mentioned at the start of this meeting and in previous meetings, CARB is required by law to write an update, the Blueprint 2.0 that will be presented to the board for adoption. The People's Blueprint, was written by a few EJ experts, several of whom are on the uh, the Zoom meeting now. And it's been a very impactful starting point for the development of, of Blueprint 2.0 by CAR. Um, so I just want everybody to know, I already said at the start of the meeting, 
that the discussions we've had over the last year about the people's blueprint are significant to informing the development of, of the blueprint 2.0 by staff. And staff will continue to seek input and consultation group meetings and maybe individual meetings uh, about uh, their work on 2.0. So staff's gonna present a draft engagement plan. Uh, and when they say engagement plan, it means an overview of the meetings and workshops that are planned uh, and the important milestone that will be uh, a milestone documents that will be released for comment during the development of Blueprint 2.0. This is going to be a transparent process. We're not going to be pulling the wool over people's eyes. We want and, and need consultation group and others input into uh, Blueprint 2.0. So now Terry is going to present staff's approach to developing Blueprint 2.0. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, up, oh, I see a hand is up. Luis. Yeah, I apologize for um, I'm not in the, the most ideal place, so I'm probably speaking out of turn here, but. Just for, for the chairman and, and everyone else, I just I feel the need to say this. As we move into a better iteration 2.0 and we hear about this, I want to remind us that when AB 617 was born, it was a negotiation, sort of bargaining chip for environmental justice because of just the, the painful policy that was gonna kind of get pushed on us with the extension of cap and trade. So whatever the future looks like for 617, I hope that part of the recalibration is giving environmental justice back its promise, legislation, and everything that comes with its implementation and resources. Having said that, I would like to see, as we learn about the new iteration 2.0, that we're moving to put the majority of the benefit and control back to environmental justice as was promised, not just an extension of a program that would go towards programmatic benefits of the air districts themselves, but give back the 617, which was intended to be for environmental justice benefits informed by, driven by, controlled by environmental justice. I know that's just a dream because I understand that agencies in power don't want to give up too much power, but you know, it is what it is. And that's the way the negotiation went. You know, unfortunately it got written in the way that it did in the 1.0. I hope that the 2.0 is more true to the spirit of 617. Thank you. Apologize for interrupting you. Looking forward to hearing the presentation. No, you know, Luis, that was an important um, comment about the historical context uh, of how AB 617 came to be. I just lectured on that today uh, at UCSF, and I, I made that point about the, the fact that AB 617 was the companion bill to the extension of uh, cap and trade. So uh, I don't think your comment was inappropriate, but now we're going to turn on, turn over to Terry to uh, give the staff presentation about the, the 2.0 process. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we'll get started here. Uh, so this first slide, um, just want to say we'll get into the engagement approach uh, in, in a few slides. Um, just wanted to highlight, you know, the iterative approach that we're going to be using for the blueprint 2.0 update. Uh, and the figure um, on the right here really just highlights uh, the main inputs that we're uh, going to use to uh, craft the new blueprint, uh, blueprint 2.0. Uh, and of course, we're going to engage with the air districts, uh, the public, uh, and obviously the consultation group uh, is going to be extremely important uh, to developing the blueprint 2.0. Um, but additionally, we'll be definitely incorporating the lessons learned uh, for 
from the people's blueprint uh, as well. Uh, so the people's blueprint is going to significantly inform uh, the pr program blueprint revision that uh, we're currently working on. Next slide. So earlier this year, uh, we presented some initial concepts for the blueprint 2.0. Um, we took that feedback that we received uh, to create the current concept outline, uh, expanded concepts outline uh, that we'll show uh, a little bit later. Um, we do plan to release the draft blueprint 2.0 uh, sometime uh, later in quarter one of next year uh, or early in quarter two. Uh, and then from the release of a draft blueprint until September of 2023, uh, we'll be wor working to release a proposed final draft. Uh, and then finally, uh, on September 28th, 2023, uh, we'll have the board hearing uh, for the final Blueprint 2.0. Next slide. So we just want to say uh, we plan to reach all of the stakeholders that we have. Uh, again, uh, this consultation group being a, a big part of that, uh, but also community steering committee groups, uh, businesses and industry, California tribal governments, academia, other state, local, federal government representatives, uh, local planning departments, and any other AB61 uh, program stakeholders that are out there. Uh, and we want to engage uh, not just in group settings, but also one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations as well. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we would like to provide, we plan to provide written uh, opportunity for written comments uh, through each phase of this process. And, uh, you know, as always, of course, this will also be an avenue, uh, this consultation group uh, meeting uh, for 617 stakeholders to provide feedback on this blueprint as well. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, based on the feedback that we've received uh, and what CARB's goals are as an agency, um, the engagement is going to re uh, revolve around community, racial equity, uh, and environmental justice. Uh, we also want to influence the engagement process uh, based on what uh, the contents of the People's Blueprint has as well. I uh, just really want to stress the desire that we want to create uh, the Blueprint 2.0 uh, in a collaborative fashion. Uh, we're not looking to you know, develop this internally uh, and then sort of announce the work that we did and, and defend it. Um, we do want to learn from communities that have been nominated but not selected uh, to learn how we can structure Blueprint 2.0 uh, to uh, better help those communities that weren't formally selected. Uh, and for the selected communities, uh, we also want to know, you know, what concerns should be addressed uh, in Blueprint 2.0. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think we're going to go to questions. Yes, let's see if there are any questions um, after the engagement plan here has been presented. Folks have any thoughts or questions? I do. Okay, Miss Margaret. I, I wish you stopped using the word community so generically. Most of us are impacted or vulnerable for something. So the language should be the impact of community or communities are vulnerable and impacted communities. That would be more that would be more closer to the truth and genuine that we are, most of us are impacted from something that we didn't cause. So there's an impact. Thank you, Ms. Margaret. Um, I think that's an important point and I've underlined it and written it down for myself. We'll take that. I would like, to, I, I would like to, that word, just community, be stricken out of the blueprint and use the word either environmental justice communities or impacted communities. Okay, impacted communities. I think OCAP is, I see people looking down and writing. So definitely are taking note of that. Did you have any other thoughts, Ms. Margaret? No, I'm good. Too. You're good, okay. I, I see Michael Kleiman's hand is raised. Yes, uh, I just wanted to ask about the timing. It seems to me that having the blueprint available as well as the people's blueprint uh, would be extremely valuable for communities who are considering nominating themselves or being nominated. And the way it's structured right now, this won't be available for the next round of selections. So is there a possibility of having uh, either the draft available 
or, or the final version available uh, by September instead of October. Any thoughts from the team? Deldi? Hi, uh, Dr. Kleiman, thank you for that comment. We certainly have heard the need for urgency um, and um, keeping in mind that our selection for 2024, we'd go to the board um, most likely in February of 2024. Um, there would be some time there between the board's action in September and preparing for that um, selection in February. It's not a lot of time, mm -hmm. Um, but I can also tell you, we are going to need um, every day that we have and a lot of weekends too, uh, between now and getting to the board hearing in September. Um, so just wanted to share uh, that in terms of a response. I think there are also some things we can do informally, um, even things we heard today um, that we don't need a new blueprint in order to start moving on. Things like working, um, to uh, create more opportunities for uh, compensated uh, mentoring and capacity building. Um, that is something we can, we can try to start look at working on concurrently. We don't need to wait until the blueprint is approved for that kind of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Margaret. I'll take my hand down. Oh, okay. Um, any other questions or thoughts about the engagement plan timeline we just have? Seen, okay. <clears throat> so the consultation group meetings are an important and necessary component of the engagement plan and they inform the staff on the consultation group's priorities um, that will go into Blueprint 2.0. And so we'd like to kind of take the temperature of folks in the room and uh, if you could raise your hand um, to show how many people have interests in contributing to this conversation? Miss Margaret, all right, Michael, Christine. So if you could raise your hand and we'll take note of who would be interested in talking in this conversation. Thank you. Okay, excellent. So I will now turn it over uh, to John, Dr. Bombs. So uh, the new document that was recently released, the draft blueprint 2.0 expanded concepts outline um, is gonna be summarized by staff next. And so these are high level concepts that'll be included in Blueprint 2.0. Um, this has been informed by the consultation group review of the People's Blueprint over the past year. Uh, you know, I've already said how important that input about the People's Blueprint uh, has been. Uh, and, you know, we encourage you to share your reactions, invite further discussions about this draft expanded concepts outline. And Terry's gonna present that and then we'll take comments. Go ahead, Terry. Can we get the slides back up? Cool. All right, um, so uh, the blueprint the first version of the blueprint focused on translating AB 617 law uh, text into an implementation guide uh, before the program had kicked off. Um, so we've learned a lot in the last four years of implementation. Uh, so if you're looking at this graphic right here on the left side in blue, uh, you'll see some of the main elements that were the focus uh, of the first blueprint, uh, things that specifically the law called for. Uh, we want to highlight the right side uh, the yellow portion, uh, some of the new approaches and guidance uh, that we are proposing to include in the Blueprint 2.0. Um, again, these approaches uh, have been informed by the People's Blueprint, uh, but also public comments at CAR board meetings, so this consultation group, CSC meetings, uh, and other focused discussions uh, that uh, we've had with program stakeholders. 
Uh, so the new blueprint will specifically address environmental justice, equity, and civil rights, uh, along with funding transparency and participatory budget budgeting. So we've heard the call to have the program benefits reach more uh, communities. Uh, many of the new blueprint elements impacted communities, sorry. Uh, many of the new blueprint elements touch on new approaches uh, towards reducing air, the air pollution burden. Uh, we've also learned a lot from the People's Blueprint as well, uh, which touches on CSC governance, onboarding, conflict resolution, budgeting, roles, responsibilities, and capacity building uh, for the various stakeholders that have been engaged in this program. Um, and so uh, it includes guidance, best practices on governance, funding, transparency, and participatory budgeting, uh, as I mentioned previously. Uh, also um, looking to improve our enforcement work as well. Uh, so uh, CARB's experimenting with working much more directly with community groups uh, which is something we'd like to highlight in Blueprint 2.0. Uh, and then uh, local SERPs uh, are uh, an approach that's already in motion in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, and so that's something uh, also that'll be a focus uh, in Blueprint 2.0. Uh, and we're also encouraging the broader use of cap incentive funds as well, uh, including in non-selected communities. Because um, these funds can be used for a number of projects uh, and a way to transfer solutions from one community to another. Uh, and then we'll also be updating the cap incentive guidelines. Uh, and that process will kick off in quarter one of 2023. Um, so that will also be an opportunity uh, to establish some new approaches uh, for program implementation. And, okay, uh, thank it. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I'll just state a couple of prompting questions to get us started on this conversation. And I believe Michelle is going to um, use the whiteboard um, notes during the discussion. The first question is, what elements are missing from this outline? And then what are other ways we can support communities besides the current model of selection by air districts convening the CSC and writing the SERP. What else would you like to share about this uh, um, outline? So those are three questions just to kind of get us started in the discussion. And if you could raise your hand um, and we'll get started. I see Ms. Marcus' hand raised and then uh, Veronica Eady. No, I'm lowering my hand. Okay. Uh, Veronica Eady. Yeah, um, I don't know if this responds to any of your questions. This is a question from Terry's presentation. Um, on that wheel, one of the things that you have is community focused enforcement. And my question is about the wording of that item, because hopefully enforcement by its nature is community focused. We've been having conversations um, with some uh, uh, community members in the Bay Area who are in, um, interested in um, what they are calling community engaged enforcement. And I think that that um, type of language indicates more of deeper involvement of community and more of a partnership with community members. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, we're at the beginning of that process, but um, it involves, you know, regular community meetings, which we're going to be, our enforcement staff is going to be doing bi-monthly. Um, but um, it also is requiring us to think about how we do enforcement. How do we respond to incidences? How do we respond to community complaints? How are we more accountable to the community? And so I would just suggest maybe, and I don't know if community engaged enforcement is the right language, but I would suggest rethinking that language so that it's a little bit more descriptive. Thank I think you. we have to uh, say impact of community engagement, right? <laughs> community informed, enforcement, sorry. Yeah. 
Thank you for those comments. Um, Ginny uh, Quintana. Hi, my um, comment was also about enforcement and uh, I'm very interested to hear about the new approaches to involving communities in enforcement because that is something that could be, to me, could have a huge impact without changing anything about the laws or anything else, obviously. Um, I remember that at the San Diego Air Pollution Control District, they presented some information about diesel emissions and that it could be 30% of that could be achieved by enforcement um, without new technology or anything. And I'm just thinking about the Imperial Valley, which I've been doing some work in, and Luis can speak to it more, but I'd really like to see enforcement um, focus on trucking companies, windblown agriculture or whatever, but rather than someone who is driving an old car and they can't afford to get a new one, you know, I, I, I just wanna make sure that the enforcement in a community, low resource community wouldn't um, fall on the backs of those that couldn't afford it, I guess. Um, so I guess, I'm not sure what the word would be, but, but um, high level enforcement, I guess is what I'm trying to say at the, at the level of the industry or the large group of, of mobile sources or something like that. And I think I need um, Veronica Eady are very well spoken there. Maybe you can translate what I'm saying. <laughs> um, I'm not exactly sure of the correct words, but I just, I, I just think that all communities could benefit from enforcement. And clearly, like Ms. Margaret said, you want to have environmental justice communities receive those resources. But um, it's also not clear to me that some air districts are very quickly ready to pivot on this. And I'm guessing some are not as quick to pivot as our, our local air district, which is really great. Um, so would it always go through the air district? Is that how, always it, how it works? Or could it go straight from CARB somehow? Or, or could you provide? I know it, in San Diego even, I think CARB funded some people extra people to check trucks at the border that were funded through CARB, I believe. Um, so just kind of thinking about how that can happen on the ground and getting advice from people. Thank you. So Jenny, I just jump in for a second. I know there's Please. people in the queue. Um, our, you know, our current enforcement division is very interested in working with communities and is already doing it several places. So, uh, and, and not focused on the low income person of color with a beat up old car. But yeah, I, I think EJ community informed or impacted community informed enforcement that Veronica suggested would be truly informed by the community. Uh, and I think in areas where the air district may not be as ready to move in that direction, you know, I think the enforcement division under its current leadership would like to hear uh, how they can help communities. I am I can speak directly for Todd, the head of the division on that. And Dildy will probably correct me because I probably said something I shouldn't. <laughs> so I jumped the queue there. I just wanted to respond to, to Jenny. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Balms. Starting with the larger emitters is definitely a better way um, to curb uh, the issues in, in impacted communities. Let's now go to Dave Edwards of OHEO. Please put me in the queue also. Yes, uh, Dave Edwards, Catherine Higgins, and then yourself, Ms. Margaret. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, thanks for uh, getting out the, um, the, the draft and just really appreciate sort of adding an exposure to part 14, which is looking at the, um, of how hacking and really um, also sort of emphasizing exposure reductions. I think that's really good. Um, I just wanted to have a comment. I think in part 11, which talks about air quality, to maybe add a little bit some exposure metrics there about understanding air quality and exposure, because then you'll actually have a sort of way to get a metric for how it's going if you're able to look from um, what is going on in the community to then if there's any reductions to that exposure. Um, I think that would be sort of a it's like a complementary piece that might be good to add. Um, and I guess 
um, this also gets to just the, I think the importance of trying to get to exposure. Um, I think we've sort of been seen in um, some different areas when there's different articles and so forth, that there is a sort of um, a real uh, high exposure due to just a single source or a point source. And um, I think it's important to try to identify those within a community. So any efforts to kind of do that um, or emphasize that is really important. Thank you for those comments. Um, Deldi, I did see your hand raised. Did you want to add something from your team? Um, let's go let's go through the rest of everyone else's comments and then I can follow up a little bit on the enforcement piece. Okay, perfect. So we'll now move to Catherine Higgins. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, the OCAP team for holding the workshops the other day. I thought those were very, very helpful. Uh, very nice segue to today's discussion. Um, it, it's unfortunate that there weren't many uh, CSC members, at least from South Coast, uh, we didn't notice uh, too many attending. Uh, I think that was a, maybe a loss of an opportunity for us to hear you know, from uh, their answers to some of these questions that might uh, be in the blueprint, um, some opportunities there from their expectation, I mean, from their perspective. Um, but I wanted to emphasize uh, that the blueprint should really clarify um, expectations of air districts, right? And, and, and distinguishing those from what might be expected from uh, community organizations or EJ groups. That has been the source, lack of clarity has been the source of, of distrust and expectations that uh, have really uh, sort of uh, bogged down the, the process and hampered, uh, um, you know, moving forward in a way that is collaborative uh, because yeah. expectations have been differing. We have discussed that, you know, a number of times on, on different panels and things, but I really want to echo that um, because no matter how uh, detailed the blueprint is, if we don't, if it doesn't really distinguish and put those guardrails there so the community members have clarity over uh, what air districts can and cannot do, uh, with regard to furthering AB 617 expectations uh, as laid out as mandated, then we're going to continue to, you know, have those hiccups in our relationships. And those are what bog down, bog down the progress when it comes to SERP development and implementation. Um, also, I wanted to just uh, comment on uh, or, or propose that there might be a little bit more emphasis on what happens beyond year five. We've discussed this a little bit in some of the subcommittees, but I, I think there is a great opportunity in the blueprint to be able to set the stage. We're now more than halfway through uh, the program, you know, with some of our communities. And so we have to start having those discussions, but I, I think the blueprint uh, is a place to be able to uh, set the, the stage for what is to be expected, how we can support communities Right in their capacity uh, building, uh, so that when that time comes, they are ready, and it it becomes a full circle process in mentoring newer communities that come in. Thank you for those comments, uh, Miss Margaret. Yes, I would like to add a couple of things. In sure. order for the community, the impacted community, to have ownership of anything, we have to be part of the building blocks. So that's, an, that's another level of, of engagement between enforcement, academia, researchers, whoever's sitting at the, at the table. And how do we make the table be equitable enough, equitable that the community is in the center of the leadership? That's number one. Then is the tools and the, re, and the tools and the resources. As we know right now, Many of our, our communities, uh, impacted communities, do not have fence line air monitoring. We don't, uh, we don't have, there's not enough researchers or data people to help us to do, build that capacity to review, uh, review any data that is collected. And then secondly, how do we take the consultants out of the picture, unless they're going to be called, become a community partner 
and educating the impacted community about the findings. And once the findings have been found in that particular community based on that condition, because each community has a different type of pollution, so it's going to be a different type of, of, of instrument may be used. All that needs to be spelled out, really spelled out. But one of the first things has to happen based on my experience understanding about how to use the data and how to collect the data has to be at the forefront of any, any type of uh, enforcement process that would include community. Uh, the impact of community. So, I, I so at the bottom line of what all I'm saying, that needs to be established citizen science type programs to support the impact of community to be able to collect that data, and that how and how and uh, being able to have the covers having policy made with enforcement how they gonna implement and, and expedite the, the, the data that's being that's been found by law because that's that's a difference. There's a difference between what the law says and then internally to of uh, expectations from the community think what the enforcement is supposed to do. So we need to have a real clear very clear clarification of all these steps that it takes to be a partner or engagement or sitting at the table with enforcement. So Thank I'm you, Ms. Margaret. So I'm suggesting first, the car has to be more supporting of a, a supporting of us and those uh, uh, impacted communities that have fence line and, and the air districts have more fence line data or monitoring to be able to, for us to capture those pollutants. And as right now, there's no such thing. Okay, more integration with the board and the air district. Yeah, but also we got to have the actual instruments placed in on the fence lines of our communities. And the resources. Yeah, we don't have, there's no such thing, really no such thing that our, our Bay Area Air Quality or Air District can go to a place, a source, and say, we're going to put these uh, air monitors on your fences. For the community. Well, someone knows. who's in the Bay, Bay Area will follow up. There's no, I'm just trying to tell you, there's no such program built in mm -hmm. to enforcement of having fence line air monitors. All the air monitors that we have had so far is been the Google Earth car that ACMA has been doing yeah. for, for, the, uh, for the nine Bay Area region. But actual fence line air monitoring, we have maybe I understood, I have understood and some refiners, they do have the monitors but everybody, all those, those who contribute to pollution, such as a port, do not have fence line air monitors. Thank you, Ms. Margaret. Ryan Hayashi. Thanks, Davina, appreciate it. Happy to be here this afternoon. Good to see all of you. I uh, just have a couple of thoughts. A, a I thought um, the outline does a really tremendous job of covering a lot of the different um, things that have been discussed in these consultation working groups, the uh, areas for improvement, uh, best practices. And so just really happy to see uh, a lot of uh, everyone's thoughts and ideas having been incorporated into this um, outline and, and looking forward to you know, continuing to work with everybody as it uh, you know, continues to further in its development. Uh, just a couple of things I wanted to, to kind of elevate similar to Dave, I, I, like uh, for me, um, the, one of the things that's been essential to this whole process has been the engagement of partner agencies. Um, you know, I think this program has um, really allowed, you know, air districts and other agencies to work more closely together to address the, the 
um, challenges, the concerns affecting impacted communities across our state. And um, you know, so many of the things that have been um, brought up and are included as measures in the, the um, adopted community emission reduction program involve a lot of needed collaboration between agencies. And um, so just, you know, making sure that, you know, as we're, we're talking about that, really, how do we get more people involved um, in that process? How do we identify the agencies that need to be involved uh, to bring resources uh, to, to those that need it the most um, it is really, really important. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, I, I was disappointed that uh, many of our staff couldn't make the, um, the, the uh, meeting on, on Tuesday. We actually had an in-person uh, meeting in uh, Arvin Lamont with our steering committee. And we're, as we, we try to move on and, and solicit input, uh, you know, it was a, a great opportunity for us to get together in person with uh, that steering committee. But it wasn't just Air District. It was members of the city of Arvin. It was Kern County uh, representatives. It was Department of Pesticide Regulation. It was, um, uh, CARB had several members. And so it, 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 you know, bringing all these people together to talk about how we can, uh, you know, move this, move their cert forward, you know, more quickly. And it only gets done by, by working with, um, you know, groups of people and, and having willing partners. And so, um, but uh, definitely, you know, kind of putting it out there that, that, that we need that help and that assistance and, and kind of explaining the needs of the communities has brought those agencies to the table to, to have these conversations and to really to participate. Um, and it's just been very uh, gratifying and, and the, the community the impacted community members are, are so thankful uh, for you know everything that's being done. Um, kind of along those same lines, all the different agencies and organizations have different relationships with the impacted communities. And so some are better and some are worse. And so what I, we found through this process, there's a lot of opportunities for, for people that may have better relationships to help build relationships with some of these other agencies with the, the, the impacted communities, the residents, as well as uh, representative organizations. And so I, I think as we're working in this, we need to kind of identify some of those issues and find opportunities to make safe spaces where we can bring all those parties together and, and, and build better relationships because ultimately that's, just, that's what's going to benefit the residents. Uh, and the people that work in these communities is, is by having good working relationships where we can get together, talk about the issues, talk about the challenges, develop specific um, methods to address the, the problems and the issues. Um, I, I'd also want to add on to you know with Catherine and maybe just expand it a little bit. Um, not so much just the authority of what you know air districts is and is not. Um, I think it's all of the agencies, so like the partner agencies as well, and making sure that that as people are getting into this program, they know exactly what the the law says um, you know, in regards to what you know. If we bring partner agencies in, what is their uh, you know legal requirements or lack thereof, um, and, and and make it focused on you know the 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 need to work with these partner agencies. So um, there may not be legal requirements, but through the sharing of the need, um, you get those organizations to move in the direction that is needed to go in. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Luis Olmedo. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, um, I was just looking at the comments um, that were made on the monitoring and I, I wanted just to add a a couple comments that come to mind. The uh, community monitoring, uh, sometimes known as citizen science, for others best known as community science. Um, CARP didn't really embrace community monitoring until AB 617 was passed, that it finally was institutionalized and therefore um, the first effort actually was AB 1187 which then you know that kind of 
got taken off the table and then maybe 617 was put on the table, which I think was a better bill. But given that the state is now institutionalized and created the 14 elements for good data, I think it's important to also anchor the dollars that are being requested through the budget process through the state budget process brought into CARB, I feel that it is a fair expectation that environmental justice be brought in to help inform as to the priorities of those dollars. And that we shorten the gap between the climate conversation and the community environmental justice conversation because Again, it wasn't CARB that put a BCP and said, we want community monitoring. In fact, having 20 plus years experience dealing with both CARB and Air District, it was, it was the opposite. The agencies did not want anything to do with community monitoring. In fact, shot it down every single time until 617. So having said that, I actually appraise enormous value into community. And 617 was never intended to be some opportunity fund for private sector or contractors or environmental consultants to go after. And it turns out that the more the time passes, the less environmental justice benefits from the much broader opportunities that come with 617. And look, in all fairness, some communities just want the data. But a lot of other communities want full participation, full. We want to make sure that we create jobs, that we do mobile monitoring, that we do stationary monitoring, that we help to the extent possible fill data gaps. We're not trying to take CARB's job. We're trying to fill data gaps. And we want to be, doing, be able to do it in an affordable way and being able to have much greater benefits, long sustainable benefits and be able to leverage philanthropy dollars locally to build expertise, to build STEM opportunities, to build environmental literacy, to build civic opportunities. The opportunities are countless and be able to graduate into placing electric vehicle chargers, to be able to building, you know, get involved in, in, in informing, you know, the energy efficiency. I mean, the opportunities of transitioning consistent with the, you know, the, the uh, Newsom administration has been pushing, all of that can be accomplished. So having said all of that, there's $30 million in the state budget. And I think another 20 million, I mean, I don't know, it's an enormous amount of dollars. I wanna make sure that we are intentional and explicit that we partake, we environmental justice partake in, in the prioritization and the distribution of these dollars to help mitigate and invest and inform what is happening in our neighborhood. Because otherwise, then we're just being utilized as we have historically as poster childs for someone else's benefit. So if we, as Ms. Margaret say, if we are the impacted community, we need to write it in every single document, including this new Blueprint 2.0, that we need to be a part of informing those dollars. And look, let's be real and let's have honest conversations. There's always two sides and two mindsets, maybe even more. And there's gonna be those who believe this genuinely and want to deliver on this new way, new direction. And there's gonna be the status quo. And we need to make sure that the people who are the keepers, holders, that this delegation of these dollars has been sent to, that they are generally vetted, environmental justice, or you know the, you know, uh, yeah, community-oriented uh, experts, or that they seek the the assistance at minimal from the environmental justice. Uh, um, uh, division or program uh, or office, sorry, but uh, but it needs to happen. We cannot continue to do business in these silos. Once CARB gets money, then everybody gets 
you know, is off the table. It gets all cooked up in a bubble, excluding us when we are the reason these dollars even exist. So that needs to be written into the blueprint and in every single office, you know, that represents or helps us environmental justice, uh, you know, play a role in the department's uh, activities, interventions, investments, that needs to be the top priority. So I, I apologize for the long-winded response. I would like that to be written into the um, 3.2.0. Thank you um, for noting what, what you believe is missing. And I think we've taken those notes down here on the whiteboard and we'll um, consider them. Christine Wolf. Thanks. Um, and want to echo everybody else. Appreciate OCAP putting together the um, detailed outline and sending that out. So um, I'm looking forward to working um, with the group on that. Um, and maybe you guys are going to talk about this, but I think my first question would be sort of just interested in the process for how that happens through the consultation group. Um, so that's uh, one question for the team. Um, I think in terms of specific comments, um, I imagine we'll work through some of these sections specifically eventually, um, but appreciate looking at sort of um, partnership and capacity building and having what might be uncomfortable conversations about sort of how um, affected sources fit into that conversation um, and understanding that there are a lot of CSCs who have had um, industry at the table. Um, I think that that's, at least from what I've heard, I think that's been helpful in a lot of cases just to understand operations and to um, have a sense of timelines for implementation since the affected sources are going to be the ones who are um, at the end of the day implementing a lot of these changes. So um, i interested in, in working through that with the group in a way that um, makes sure that we don't compromise uh, centering impacted communities in the conversation like um, a lot of folks have already mentioned. So um, you know interested and in, and in looking forward to thinking through how, what that looks like. Um, and then also, I think we've brought this up before too about measuring progress and what that looks like. I think that's gonna be um, uh, a challenge given that different um, communities have different baselines um, and different programs, but, um, and that the CSC itself probably defines the objectives of, of what success looks like, um, but definitely interested in hearing CARB's perspective through the Blueprint 2.0 of sort of how um, progress will be measured across different communities, given different priorities in different communities. Um, and then I guess following off of the conversations that um, a couple of folks have already raised about monitoring data, um, I'm wondering if CARB is going to conduct a data review of what's already been collected um, as part of camps or SERP development or, or other programs, and whether or not that will be is that part of Blueprint 2.0 or is that sort of a, a different track that might be um, sort of a, a different part of 617 implementation in the Blueprint? But I think we'd all be interested in hearing what the outcome of um, data collection and um, study has been. So those are my, my questions. Primarily interested in understanding sort of what the progress, the process looks like uh, moving forward from here in terms of consultation group input on the um, blueprint. Thank you, Christine, uh, for those comments. And I see they're typing them up and um, we'll, I don't know if they want to respond in this moment, but definitely we'll respond to you um, in the near future. Louise, your hand is still raised. Did you have another thought that you'd like to add? Okay. So just again, um, we asked the question, what elements are missing from this outline? Um, what other ways can we support communities besides the current model of selection by air districts and CSCs and writing at SERP? And what else would you like to share about this outline? So I don't see any other hands raised. Um, and so I guess it's now time for public comment. Dr. Bombs, do you want to take it from there? Sure. Um, so 
Uh, do we have any public uh, participant hands raised? We probably should remind people on the phone too, but it's hashtag two to raise your hand. Yes. Uh, and no one um, in has their hands raised. Just give them a moment to make sure we don't rush past people who want to speak. Mm -hmm. Anybody else on the consultation group? Christine, Christine Wolf. Yeah, and I'll ask one more question if we're waiting for folks from the public. Sure. Um, okay. I think it was um, Kevin Hamilton, maybe, who I'm not sure if he's here today, who was working on the, the local SERP um, project in San Joaquin, and maybe there are other folks on the call today who are involved in that. Um, but I'm I'm not as involved in the San Joaquin Valley, so I'd be really interested um, if at a future consultation group meeting or some other meeting, if they could give like a presentation on what that is looking like. I know I've heard folks bring it up and and feel excited about it, but um, just interested in sort of what that looks like and how it's working. If others are as well, I certainly would. Uh, I know that Kevin would probably be happy to talk about it. Uh, Got to be careful what you wish for, you, you know, because Kevin will go on. Uh, but uh, I just want to ask Gustavo, do you have anything to to add? Just putting you on the spot there about what's going on with uh, that CCAC grant to, to try to uh, build capacity. Oh. And there's, you know, Ryan may be able to speak to that. I'll just ask Gustavo first. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Baums. Nothing to add at the moment. Okay. Still, still catching myself up on that. Okay, so Ryan, you, you probably know a little bit about it. Yeah, no, um, you know, early on, and we, we gave a letter of support for um, the CCAC's uh, CAD grant and was happy to see that they got it. And uh, they engaged us early on. and. They're definitely um, in the, you know, in the in the process of figuring out what works best, and so um, what they've invited us to a few meetings and um, kind of the initial conversations are just educational. They're they're providing education to the communities that they're engaging with, and um, we met with Kevin. We plan on having regular meetings with them about you know how air districts uh, or. You know, specifically us, how we can uh, assist in the uh, development of the, the local SERPs. And um, to date, I think there's about six communities that they're, they're um, looking to work with. And um, you know, we participated in, in several of those meetings. And um, uh, you know, he's looking to bring in uh, you know, other agencies as uh, different topics come up. And uh, you know, it's, it's much more extensive than just um, air pollution, it sounds like. And so um, you know, we're just excited to you know, be involved because it is important to find a way to bring more resources to more of the communities outside of just AB uh, 617 um, selected communities. So it's a, it it's a, has a lot of uh, exciting potential. And so we just uh, look forward to, to seeing what, uh, how we can help. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, and Mike, I know you have your hand up, but let's, Gustavo put his hand back up, I think. Yeah, and just very quickly, uh, uh, Dr. Bombs, something that I, I can share is from CCJN's perspective, we're also supporting uh, in those like potential communities that are not part of 617, but could definitely benefit from like a camp and a SERP. And so um, I was part of like their initial kickoff meeting in Terabella, where it was CCAC and we uh, I, we did a presentation on like air quality 101 and uh, sources of pollution, public health concerns, et cetera. So yeah, we talked about SERP, uh, you know, development. So I know there's already quite a, a bit of communities. Um, and I, I believe also the Center for Race, Poverty in the Environment also um, co-led a meeting with them down in Delano. So yeah, I know they're already having uh, initial meetings with the residents, uh, committees, and community leaders there. Yeah, so I think... Uh... We can get a, Christine, I think we can get a report out of Kevin um, at a future meeting. It's a good suggestion. So Mike, you've been patient. 
Yeah, uh, I just wanted to go back to what uh, Luis was uh, saying a little while ago. And uh, I was wondering if uh, it would be possible to work some language uh, into the uh, blueprint saying that uh, where possible uh, local businesses and local uh, resources should be used to uh, help with the mitigation and monitoring process. So perhaps there are companies that, uh, you know, in the community that uh, will supply uh, parts, labor, and other things uh, that can help with uh, the process rather than going out to outside contractors to come in and, and deal with it. Thanks, Mike. Um, it's always good if we could get uh, resources contributed from uh, local businesses and potential sources of emissions. Um, so uh, any public uh, audience participants wanting to speak? Still no hands up right now. So we should probably move on to our next item then. So Davina, do you wanna, oh, actually it's Lily. You're supposed to introduce the next item. Yeah, it's the ad hoc governance update. Awesome, let me, um, caught me off guard. <laughs> I had been following the whole time. All right, so um, uh, just a reminder for everyone, the ad hoc governance work group, um, it really was convened out of a recommendation from Mindy Meyer and uh, Lisa um, Ballin. When they did an assessment of the consultation group, they let us know we really need to focus here on creating a charter for the group. Um, and this was one of their strongest recommendations is to create a, a, a temporary group to focus just solely on the charter. Um, and I just wanna thank the consultation group members who have been um, spending their time with us. Um, Christine Wolf, Jess Olson, Catherine Higgins, and I think sometimes Susan comes in and just thanks so much for um, covering each other to make sure that you guys are, everyone is um, contributing to the conversation. Kevin Hamilton, Miss Margaret, and Paula Torado. I know that um, meetings on top of meetings, um, on top of more meetings. Uh, so we just really appreciate it. And also our chairs are there, really got helping um, give us their perspective, either historical perspective of how the consultation group started and, um, and uh, just uh, their perspective as carport members. So thank you so much. Um, with all that, we've had three meetings so far. Um, and in that we've reviewed other charters to um, to develop the elements that we want, uh, we, that the consultation group ad hoc members want to um, include in the charter. And the plan is of course to bring um, recommended language to the full consultation group. Um, and this language, once the ad hoc group members, you know, decide on language um, to bring, we would bring that um, to the full consultation group when it's appropriate. But right now they are starting with the purpose and the mission statements. And so far there's been agreed upon some following concepts. Um, the work of the consultation group should be centered around equity and environmental justice. Um, the consultations group purpose is for consultation purposes. So to inform CARB as it develops the statewide strategy, which is the blueprint. And the consultation group is not a place for con um, community steering committee specific issues to be resolved. And then there's also um, this need to characterize the ways that members participate and why. Um, so these are the conversations that the group is having. And I'm wondering if any of the members um, would want to add to anything. Um, about their priorities or how the meetings. Well, um, 
I'll just say one thing uh, that uh, I appreciate. Miss Margaret, uh, the last meeting really uh, centered us uh, on trying to define uh, a clear consultation group purpose and mission before we get into the nitty gritty of you know, charter spe specific uh, issues. And uh, I think she was right. Uh, so we were hoping to have, you know, some language to present to you, but uh, we need to work on the language of purpose and mission for the consultation group before we can do that. I just want to thank Ms. Margaret for, you know, centering us on that. I don't know if she wants to say anything. Hope I didn't mischaracterize anything you said. Miss Margaret, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, I did say and did make a recommendation that the consultation group needs to stop being the place for complaints at the other at, at the different SERPs or steering committee meetings about uh, dealing with business, planners, air districts, whatever. It needs to be moved over to a Department of Civil Rights and Environmental Justice. Because if the, if the consultation group was, was intent to be working on state strategies, we, we, we are not nowhere near state strategies if we are constantly being the place where people bring in those co complaints. I would like to see, and I'm really recommending that the, the Office of Civil Rights, to be a development of Office of Civil Rights and Environmental Justice to handle those things, to be able to do investigations, to do all those, those things to help, to help those communities when they feel as they're not being treated equitably or having a real uh, equal uh, equity at the process of where they're trying to do their planning. All right, so I just see that uh, yes, there needs to be a whole nother division process department for all those things now. Thank you, Miss Margaret. Does anybody? else want to comment about the ad hoc governance work group? I'll we say a few things. Oh, there, were, ahead. there were three themes that really, um, when I look at my notes, we talked a lot about, which was equity and being very explicit about the use of that word in the charter, as well as a balance of power discussion. And um, Ms. Margaret brought it up earlier today about really talking about impacted communities and the cumulative impact that some of these communities have faced. And I guess the third kind of important um, talking thread was making sure communities are at the table when it comes to decision-making. Um, and, and thinking about those three things um, and integrating that into our mission and, um, and uh, purpose. That's all. Any other comments? I mean, this purpose, the purpose of the ad hoc governance uh, group is to try to make our work on the consultation group uh, go more smoothly, uh, you know, so that we have uh, a better structure and process. I mean, I'm very pleased with the last few meetings uh, compared to our earlier meetings. So we're, we're learning as we go, but we wanna codify that. Um, and again, as Lily mentioned, um, our consultants uh, from Sacramento State strongly recommended that we you know, come up with this charter. So uh, we will, we, the members of the ad hoc governance group, and it's fluid, You know, if other people wanna join, they're welcome. Uh, We'll bring back to the larger group 
whatever we come up with. And just like we aren't going to impose uh, Blueprint 2.0 without uh, conversation, we're not going to impose uh, a governance structure without uh, everybody having a chance to weigh in. Dr. Balms, it looks like there is a question from Richard Grow on the oh. charter. Hi, Richard. Can you unmute yourself? Yep. Hi, uh, this is Richard Grow. Some of you already know me. On this question of charter, though, just a suggestion going back to my longtime involvement in environmental justice in Title VI within the agencies and without, is I hope the charter already or will emphasize up front on all participants in this process a, a commitment to equity and environmental justice and civil rights, including compliance with civil rights. Some of this is already a requirement by law, but I don't think folks really understand functionally that almost everybody around the table at this process, certainly anybody who receives state or federal funds is already required by law to comply with civil rights policies and procedures, uh, which if folks look at them closely actually requires a systematic, systematic consideration of equity and avoidance of discriminatory effects. So somehow or another, if that can be highlighted up front, meaning if you're, if you're gonna be at this table, you share that commitment, not just a platitude, but to in practice, in action. Thank you. And thank you, Richard. And I think uh, uh, Supervisor Hurt, you know, mentioned that right up front when she was going over the three themes that we talked about. Yes, we agree with you that that's, you know, extremely important and it will get into the, uh, into the charter uh, mission and purpose right up front. Okay, just uh, thanks, John, but just a qualifier. I appreciate it as a theme, but no, I, I'm actually asking, I think it ought to be a demand of folks. If you're gonna involve, be involved in this process, you are committed to compliance. I, I understand. Okay, thank you. And, and also Dr. Baum, that is why I'm, I'm asking that the complaints not come back to um, through the consultation group because there's nothing set up for compliance. Right, I understand. You want a formal mechanism uh, for compliance. Right. Yep. I think, Luis, did you just put your hand up? Okay, can I just stop? Something came to my mind here at this conversation about the civil rights. And it's my understanding, I don't know if some or all do a sworn statement, whether it be written or in person or by a an authority, uh, that people get sworn in into office somehow, right? Either into employment or in office. So if there is that sworn duty, I imagine that it calls out to uphold the mission. But I know sometimes these sworn commitments call out certain things. And I wonder if, just out of curiosity, we don't have to discuss it too much now, but if somebody had an answer, does these sworn commitments also include the sworn commitment to uphold the state's obligations on civil rights? If not, here's an opportunity to amend that. Right? I'm just saying it may, may take a lot, you know, but why not? Yes, I understand your suggestion, Luis, and uh, I think it's in line with what Ms. Margaret and Richard uh, have brought up. So uh, because we want to make civil rights uh, a key part of the whole AB 617 process uh, program, um, 
you know, I think we can take under advisement your suggestion that some kind of uh, sort of swearing in of commitment to civil rights and uh, equity be, uh, you know, part of the requirement of membership on the consultation group. We'll definitely think about that. So thank you for bringing uh, it. Yeah, actually, yeah, Chairman, it, it wasn't just that. It was because if I understood Richard, maybe I don't want to misconstrue his words. But at least I interpret as this needs to also be an obligation of agency wide, statewide. But we are living in a point in time when this administration made very specific commitments. And it shouldn't be unreasonable to expect that the sworn oaths that exist on this state for civil service, that it include and it calls out explicitly the commitment to uphold civil civil rights. Well, you know, uh, I'm not a legal expert, so I don't know about going beyond the consultation group in that regard. I think Richard's right that it is a requirement of uh, government service to uphold civil rights. It's a federal law. Um, but in terms of you know, sw sworn oaths to that regard, uh, you know, I, I can't speak to that, but I do think that uh, as part of membership in the consultation group, we can we can have our own uh, requirements that we will definitely think about in the ad hoc governance group and bring it back to the, the larger consultation group. Uh, John? Yeah, Richard, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, and I'll, I'll get out of here, but to be clear, the requirement applies to the organizations that that's the recipients, meaning if a state agency receives even one dollar or a local agency, a county or a city. So it, what I had in mind is not the individual swearing this, but that their organizations, if they're going to be at the table, they have to commit, be able to commit on behalf of their organization that it will comply with yeah. civil rights. Thank you, Richard, for that clarification. Thank you. I'll get out of here. <laughs> no, it's you don't have to get out of here. That was totally uh it was important and impactful uh, comment. So I don't think we have anything more to say about the ad hoc governance group at this point. Uh, Lily, uh, I think CARB updates are next. Yeah, we just have one slide. And actually it's been touched on a lot today already. Um, the, I just, well, not this specific thing, but the community air grants have been really? Yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but kind of before we lose the flow and the momentum here, um, I just wanted to note Chanel's got her hand oh, up. I'm oh. sorry, Chanel. Whoops. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, Chanel. it's okay. I feel like I, I keep, um, I keep putting my hand up after the conversation flow starts to wrap up. I also changed my background so I could match the carb vibe. So I was proud of myself there. Um, I did want to- Right. You know, I just wanted to be a part of the team there. Um, I did want to speak to a little bit of um, the civil rights conversation. And I know that, you know, Steve had had a meeting with uh, some of the members of CEJC. Miss Margaret, I know, was there. One of the things that we did discuss was actually Steve's commitment around civil rights. Some of you may know that Steve uh, spent some time in the federal space. He was at NHTSA. And while he was there, they actually had an office of civil rights. And that was kind of a place where um, they were addressing the Title VI, but also I think that place where when we're talking about the complaints, there was a kind of a channel to go to and build in some of that accountability. And I think we've also seen at the federal level with the US EPA, um, their kind of merger, right, of environmental justice and external civil rights. And so one of the things that Steve has really been, I think, um, focused on and really thinking through is how do we create um, an office of civil rights. And so this is not something that I would say, and I think even he would say when we talked about it with CEJC, it isn't something that I think is fully flushed out. And so I think we actually had a really good conversation with Miss Margaret and thinking about, well, what is the intent of this and what does it look like? And we talked about 11135, right? And, and so I think that that actually gave Steve a lot to think about, but I would be remiss if I didn't kind of mentioned to this larger group in the context of civil rights, that is something that he's very committed to and that he wants to think through um, with, I think, environmental justice um, communities. 
what is this kind of like when we're talking about this office of civil rights what is its role when we're talking about title 6 1135 and i think how does it function as that way of giving accountability which i do think is really necessary and i think the last point i would probably make is that the idea for this office right is that in some ways we're, we're seeing for each division in each program that commitment to um, integrating civil rights and i think it's a place where that if if there's if we're not seeing that happen right this could be a place people can go to bring that up. So it's very much in the formative stage, but I know that he shared it with some members. And so I wanted to make sure that was shared collectively with all. And Deldi, I know you were a part of that conversation as well as, well as Ms. Margaret. So I'm happy to have Ms. Margaret or Deldi or anybody else who was there kind of chime in with their reflections as well. Well, I just want to thank you, Chanel, because I didn't know about this. Uh, so. When Ms. Margaret talked about an office of civil rights, I thought she was just wishing for that. Um, but it sounds like there's actually some discussions about it actually getting established. So that's good to know. And, and why I'm saying it, the history of the complaints that come uh, that has been coming to the consultation group have been about the civil rights of the community to have the ability to have the empower of 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 as a community of color over some of the decision makings that has been done either from the industry or in connection with the air district and industry have taken the power away from the that impact the community to make a decision based on what they what they see is the plan. So that's why I've been pushing, that's why I've, I've changed the narrative to talk about civil rights and environmental justice. Thank you, Ms. Margaret. I know you've been working on this for a long time. Um, I'll just add one more thing and then I, I promise John, I'll let you keep going. Um, Janelle, don't, don't have to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I won't apologize, I'll just take it. Um, I did wanna say that I think, um, and so part of my work with Steve has been, I think for him at least part of the impetus, and I and I know some some people have been tracking this um, in the SIP space. Others may not have, right? So for some, it's information you already know. For some, it's new. But um, part of the impetus, I think, on his end was really through um, our San Joaquin Valley PM 2.5 SIP and the proposed disapproval. Um, and I know that a number of um, different environmental justice you know, organizations were involved in that around Title VI. And so I think for Steve that was kind of one of the impetus. And so I think what's been, to me, I think, um, helpful in some ways is that both Phil D and I have also been able to say to Steve that, you know, Title VI doesn't just exist in the SIP space. I think we've been able to, I think, and this is really through, honestly, um, the communities that are here, right? Because a lot of this stuff predates me, been able to show examples of some of the civil rights complaints that we've gotten and received through, I think, um, the 617 process. And so I think for Steve, what he's seeing, right, is that we don't want to just silo um, Title VI, right, into either whether it's SIPs or 617, but we want to think about our agency-wide approach, which I think as anyone would know, we have to be doing already, and think about how we're building in that accountability. So, um, like I said, it's very much formative, but I do think it's helpful um, for, for this group to know, and I know, Ms. Margaret, one of the things that's on Steve's list is to follow up with you and to get, I think, a little bit more clarity on his end but also kind of kind of brainstorming with you so if he does not do that i will definitely text him now and tell him to remind to, to reach out to you on that front thank you chanel uh and thank you miss margaret um let's see lily we didn't let you uh give your carb update and sure it's just a quick announcement um on December 14th, there's gonna be a workshop um, to kick off the community air grants funding process. And like I said, we've been mentioning the importance of the community air grants and how it could be used um, to build capacity in communities for them to um, engage in the um, six, AP 617 process. So one thing that I wanna highlight is for the first time, they are now allowed to use communities to write their own local emissions um, reduction plans. I think the other one was like a special, like this is the first time it's actually in the solicitation. Um, so um, I encourage you all to apply, I mean, to, to attend the workshop to get more information. And here's um, the grant request applications are open now to um, 
March um, 2023. And I think. Yeah, and I think, you know, it says support for community operated air monitoring. I think this is what, too. you know, uh, Luis and Miss Margaret were getting at. Uh, Ms. Margaret said fence line monitoring and, you know, and Luis uh, talked about uh, his long experience uh, with uh, community monitoring, community science. So I think that's what we mean here, <laughs> support for that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we can drop a link in the chat my, um, for, for the uh, workshop. And so, it. yeah. So now uh, we're actually at a public comment period for any kind of public comments related to AB six one seven. Maybe we should hear from Deldi real quick before we oh, open. It. Yes, I'm sorry, Deldi. No, 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 no need. I was actually just going to. Um, see if if there was um, some time to talk about next steps on our um, future meetings, but I think that will come later. So let's go ahead and see if there are any members of the public um, who want to speak up. Yeah, next steps is the next thing on the agenda after public comments. Okay. The public is quiet today. Well, there's always the opportunity to you know comment via the docket. I think that we've dropped the link in the chat um, for the docket on the expanded concepts document outline. Um, and that is open till January 19th. But of course, this is a long process till we get to September 2023. So, so Deldi, um, do you want Lily to go on to next steps? Sure, why don't we do that? Thank you. All right, so... Um, we have two consultation group meetings already set for next year, um, March 8th and the 19th. And um, both from 1 to 4 p.m., I think they're both on Wednesdays, um, we'll be setting a agenda setting meeting for the first one in February and the likely the second one soon after um, March 8th. Um, one thing I do want to highlight is um, for the March 19th, meeting um, in, in accordance with the draft, um, uh, let's see, uh, Blueprint 2.0 revision engagement plan and the timeline. In that meeting, we're hoping that we'll discuss the, um, the Blueprint 2.0 draft. And then in the July meeting, um, we're hoping we could discuss the, um, the final draft of the Blueprint 2.0. Um, so we're really um, wanting to focus the April and July meetings um, in the consultation group, July to be determined um, on um, where we're at in the Blueprint um, 2.0 development. Lily, can I ask you to clarify, please? Because I think you said March 19th. Did you mean April 19th for discussion have, of the narrative? I definitely met April 19th. Okay, April 19th. Thank you. And then one thing just to flag for everyone's benefit, our group went through this um, earlier this year, but I, I believe that come July, um, and Chanel, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, you or Trish, in terms of the uh, Bagley Keen uh, requirements kicking in again for in-person meetings. Um, I think in July that exemption, that current exemption may expire. And so 
for July then, we would be uh, looking to organize that meeting to be in person. Okay, so getting a chat from correct from Chanel that's saying that's correct. So I just want to tell you right, right all right now in um, December of 2022 that when we meet in July, we're really going to be relying on everyone as much as possible to make sure we can have a quorum for an in-person meeting. Thank you, Delta. That's important information. And you know, as much as I appreciate everybody's uh, efforts on Zoom here, uh, I do think uh, you know face-to-face -face meetings have their value. So, and, and it's also the law, but the in-person meetings. But. And and it does look like we have Jesse who'd like to make a comment. Jesse, before we go to your comment, I do want to just say about the agenda setting uh, conversation for February, we wanna get a date on the calendar pretty soon so that folks know um, when to participate to help make sure we're on the right track with the agenda. Um, we have at least two topics other than the um, update and conversation about the blueprint. We had a topic um, uh, requested actually from our monitoring and laboratory division partners in CARB. Um, this is the division that is responsible for uh, implementing the monitoring, the mobile monitoring that was called for in the $30 million budget change proposal. Um, and Luis, this is something you mentioned today. There's been conversation about it today. So I just wanna flag that um, our, our CARB partners have, our division partners in MLD have, um, uh, are, are, are hopeful that this group would like to have a conversation about that PCP. I'm wondering if we could just have a show of um, Zoom hands from the consultation group members if you would be interested in that topic in March. Uh, I mean, I'm going to say absolutely. And I, I <laughs> love the fact that they're already thinking about this. You know, I got ahead of it. So that's the best case scenario. OK. And thank you for all for that. And then the other topic we heard suggested was an update from um, the uh, Valley-based uh, community-based organizations, environmental justice organizations that are working through the local CERP process um, in the Valley to hear an update and have a conversation with them. So we have those two topics. Catherine, do you have your hand up? Oh, sorry, Luis, did I cut you off? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm working off my phone here. I just want to say that I appreciate hearing this, Daldi, in the way that it's been, that you've presented it and the dialogue and the proactive approach of engaging EJ. Uh, and I do want to say that I make a commitment to be better as the agency becomes better. You know, a lot of times we come in at it from a point of disadvantage and exclusion. So, you know, we're not, at least for me, I'm not always thinking that the agency is going to think of these things ahead of it. So we're already coming in as they're going to forget about it again. <laughs> you know, so I want to be thankful of the fact that I see the agency doing much better and I appreciate that. So thank you for that news, Delhi. Oh, thank you, um, Luis, for your comment, and I will pass that on to our um, uh, partners in the monitoring laboratory division who who initiated this. Thank you. And so, Jesse, have you figured out how to work your phone there? Brian's put something in the chat for you. Yeah, if Jesse can confirm that's his phone number, we can we can turn that one on so we can hear him. Are you the 310 number, Jesse? I think you can unmute now. Hello, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yes, Jesse. Okay, great. Been trying to figure out what's going on with the mic here. Anyways, I was reviewing the community air production blueprint and realize that there is an element 
that's missing. And it should be, it should follow number 12. I mean, number 11, which says understanding your community air quality. This one should be number 12. Understanding air pollution's impacts on public health. For example, A, what air pollution types slash chemicals cause what type of health problems? We know we have one category called criteria pollutants, another category toxic air pollutants. We know there's hazardous air pollutants. So we know by category they exist. But then we also learn over time that specific chemicals can cause specific types of health problems. So other things we need to know are, what are the types of air pollution that cause respiratory health problems? What types of air pollution cause cancer? What types of air pollution causes child development problems? What are the short long-term cumulative impacts of exposure from multiple air pollution types and chemicals. Because I, ha I, get, I receive a call or a visit every year, every year from parents wanting to come meet me, ask me if I can come to their home. And they're telling me our child was just diagnosed with leukemia. We spoke with a doctor and a nurse and somebody else that was there too. And when we asked them what caused it, they did not know. They didn't even ask, well, by the way, do you live by an oil refinery? <laughs> do you live by you know, chemical storage tanks? They don't do any preliminary research to help discover the source and cause of the health problems. It hurts me every time to listen to these members of the community not knowing what the doctor is even telling them and the doctor is not even sure themselves. We need to be honest. If you live in a petroleum industry community, there are specific chemicals you are being exposed to every single day. And yes, and I don't know why, nobody knows why, Maybe only certain individuals or certain children might get a specific, you know, health impact compared to everybody like in a family. We don't know that. All I know is that, you know, there are many and numerous members of the community suffering many different diseases. Even one we sort of discovered on our own. A woman was telling me that she had been under a lot of pain, went to the doctor, and she was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Well, guess what I've learned over the years as an activist? Almost everyone I know that's been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, house where they live was built on top of oil refinery land, storage tank facility land, oil well, dairy land. So that is a clue right there as to what causes that. Parents have told me we went, took our doctor our child to the doctor for school in September. And he was okay, but he was diagnosed with only one little thing, you know, which was, uh, um, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting right now. Uh, uh, well, Luis, oh. I, think, I think it's, your point yeah. is well taken about public health and the connections with air pollution. So. Yes, because see, our regulatory agencies have a responsibility for full disclosure of what are the impacts of exposure to air pollution and the various types. And that's what I'm asking that this should be one of our elements that needs to be addressed. It should not be the responsibility of members of the public or residents, parents, students having to conduct our own research in order to find out what causes leukemia. What causes fibromyalgia? Oh, anemia was the other word I was thinking of. A child's identified with anemia. Well, if a parent tells me that, that is one of the first symptoms of anemia, lymphoma, 
myeloma. And when we did a study 10 years ago, we, where we had over 600 Wilmington and Carson residents participate in our health study, we discovered about 100 people who had anywhere from five to almost 15 or more symptoms of leukemia and myeloma. Yet the doctor had not really diagnosed them as being on that track towards a cancer. Okay, well, thank you, Jesse. And uh, we've taken notes about uh, what you think is a missing element to the outline. So thank you for bringing up public health. Okay, thank you. Dr. Balms, I also see Ms. Margaret's hand raised before we um, adjourn. Okay, uh, well, I have been, for the past two years, I have been asked to do presentation with a medical student. Can you hear me? I'm, is it breaking up? We can hear you, Ms. Margaret. Okay, I've been having presentations with young medical students about environmental justice. And one of the things I promote to them as part of my presentation is, when a patient come in, do you look at the zip code for the, their demographics to know, have some idea where, where they live, work, play, pray, as identified to be supportive of whatever their, uh, their ailment is? No, they do not. And that's one of the things that could really support the medical system if they had the ability to look at the people's, the patient's zip codes and, uh, and understand the impacts based on where their people live. As, uh, and it should be a fundamental thing to know where your patient live at and that if there are any impacts from, a, from, from, from an industry, a business that's surrounding them. Very You're simple. right. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Very simple. Look up the look up the patient's demographic uh, zip code. So I just want to say, as a medical educator, uh, you're absolutely right. Place matters, and there is increasing attention at UCSF, where I teach medical students, uh, about the structural determinants of health, which include where you live and what you're exposed to where you live. So both you and Jesse are right. Uh, we need healthcare practitioners to uh, inquire about uh, neighborhood factors, including environmental exposures. And, you know, change takes time, but I think actually, uh, you know, people are appreciating that uh, the need for that change in medical education. Luis. Yeah, man. hope I don't get cut off, but um, one thing I like to, for this consultation to take on is making the link back of climate pollutants to top six criteria pollutants because some climate pollutants can be proxy uh, precursors to toxics and criteria pollutants. So somewhere where we, as a state and as a country and as a planet, have invest transition to investing enormous amounts of dollars in, in climate, which I agree with. We've divested um, in proportion from contaminants that are impacting our community. So I, I don't know if it's in line with what's being discussed, but I feel that it is, uh, especially the comments Ms. Margaret and Jesse just made. And while of the whole conversation is about that, but we need to tie it back again. So we're not doing one over the other, we're doing both. Yes, and I think I can speak for the agency, even though I'm just one board member. We try to, to uh, get climate mitigation and air quality co-benefits with every regulation that we do now. 
Uh, so, um, you know, it's, there's no question that we have to continue to uh, address both. And it's actually fairly easy to address both because um, burning of fossil fuels uh, produces both, it's the main contributor to both uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, health damaging air pollutants. So you're right, you're right Luis, uh, as well as Miss Margaret and uh, Jesse about uh, the greater need for uh, finding out where someone lives, works, plays, prays, as Miss Margaret said. I think we're uh, probably at the end of our agenda now. And I, I yes, think that are. nobody would probably mind us um, finishing early. I know I won't because I've literally been uh, on Zoom meetings almost every hour since eight o'clock. Ditto. So I don't see any more hands raised. I think we can do meeting adjourned. And again, thank everybody. I want to thank everybody uh, for their time and effort on the consultation group. Another good meeting. Thank you. And Thanks I want to thank well, I want to thank our board members, uh, Davina Hurt and Dr. Baums. You all are incredibly busy and pull so many ways. And I, we, we all want to thank you for being here and helping us um, support this conversation in such a constructive way. It's a pleasure to be a part of this group. Thank you for the invitation. We wouldn't be here if we didn't uh, think it was important. Oh, yeah. And happy holidays, everyone. Yes. Happy holidays. Take Happy care. Holidays. Thank you. Happy holidays.